Good morning. We're going to start off by singing about the sweet, sweet spirit. Let's, let's stand as we sing this song. The Holy Spirit, which dwells within us, but isn't it wonderful when we're all together? The Spirit comes down upon us. There's a sweet, sweet. same and uh, we praise the Lord for it and uh, well let's go to Lord in a word of prayer okay Father we again are grateful for the opportunity to be with your people and uh, Lord to be in your presence and Lord to sing praises and, and glorify your name and, uh, and uplift you uh, because of all that you are and all and who you are to us and what you've done for us and uh, we pray you'd have your way and will in the service today and I pray that you would <clears throat> Uh, uplift our hearts with the music and the message today as we look towards heaven and uh, and ask that you speak to us and lead us and guide us into truth and um, we'll give you the honor and glory and praise for all that you do in us and through us and for us today thank you again for your love and mercy in Jesus name amen <clears throat> let me say welcome to Mount Carmel Baptist Church today and I don't know where everybody is today but uh, it that, <laughs> Everybody, uh, you know, uh, everybody, it's a nice day outside. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they're, they're out of town. I do know we do have some that are out sick, so uh, you be, you be, I'll mention some of those here in a bit, so uh, you lift those up in prayer. And I do also know that I have asked that if you have any sniffle or, or cough or anything like that to stay home, and I know the pollen and all that kind of stuff is starting to come out too, and a lot of people have allergies and things like that, so uh, that may be where some of them are. So anyway, so... Uh, let's, uh, let me just, by way of announcements, let me just say, uh, we need to congratulate, well, the only one I see here, unless I'm missing somebody, is Miss Brenda. Miss Brenda has a new great-grandchild, and, uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, Miss Lindsay Hurley gave birth yesterday, well, it was in the wee hours yesterday, early morning, uh, like two, two o'clock something, he te uh, Chip texted me about the, about the uh, time, but it was like two o'clock in the morning. And, uh, and anyway, little, his, his name is Nolan Ray Hurley, and I uh, weighed 7 pounds, 11 ounces, 21 and a quarter inches long, 
and uh, proud parents are Dylan and Lindsay, and we are so grateful. Everybody's doing well, and we praise the Lord for it. And uh, and then also next Sunday is going to be a baby day for them, and so uh, don't don't we just had a baby day. So uh, look, we can have baby days every Sunday as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but I, I love these little ones, and, uh, and 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 new little ones coming all along. And so um, so you be in prayer for them, and then also. Uh, next Sunday is going to be baby day for them, and, and uh, from what I understand, I spoke to Miss Paula earlier about this, and, and uh, just uh, diapers and wipes, diapers and wipes. That's all you hear, you know, diapers and wipes, because they go through them, and uh, and them things are not not cheap. So any any bit uh, that you can help with that, I'm sure that it would be appreciated. Be appreciated. So that is next Sunday. So don't forget, I'll have a or somebody send out a, an email about that to remind you, <clears throat> and then also the wild game supper. Uh, coming up on the 20th. Uh, that's not very far off now. And so, and uh, John David is the one that kind of uh, has, has hit, it, I don't say headed that up, but he has kind of helped organize and, and get things going with all this. And so he's doing that again this year, and I appreciate him doing that. And uh, But he wants to have a meeting uh, immediately after church with those who would uh, want to help participate. Uh, in, in helping with some of the activities and things that are going to be going on. There's a lot of preparation, a lot of planning has to go into this, and so he's trying to get with the ones who, who are going to be here and the ones that want to help with that and uh, before he starts uh, delegating and appointing and all those kind of things, right? And so, uh, so and he'll discuss with you, you know, the things that we're looking at and, and uh, wanting to do. And so uh, right after church, right after church, we'll say right down here, right after church, and, uh, and John David will conduct that meeting. All right. All right, I think that's it. Let's sing. <clears throat> I've just been so excited. Couldn't wait to sing this song. And so now that we can feel more free about using our soundtracks and everything, I, I said I've got to sing this song. And it's a wonderful, beautiful song that tells the whole story of Christ. And I'm telling you, this song is amazing. So let's stand and sing this song and sing it with a feeling of conviction here.
y'all sound, you sang it wonderful. What a blessing it is and what glory to be given to God.
All right, some prayer requests to leave with you for this week. Um, this one just came in from uh, Faith Cagle. <clears throat> her brother, Wayne Mabe, and then also it would be her nephew. Um, I don't have a name for that one, but um, Wayne had an automobile accident and, uh, and is going to end up having to have knee surgery. And then the son also um, hurt himself playing wrestling, uh, not playing wrestling, but wrestling. And, uh, and so both of them are, are going to require knee surgery, and then they have a chicken farm, so they have chicken houses and all that, so both of them are going to be out uh, for one of them six to eight weeks, one of them four to six weeks, and, uh, and so it's going to be kind of tough on them. So remember this, the Wayne Mabe and, and then his son. <clears throat> this is Faith Cagle's uh, brother and nephew. And then also April Cagle um, is going to be going this week for, for a, uh, a biopsy. Right, and uh, and so that's this coming Tuesday, right? All right. So remember her, and then um, and then also uh, I don't see the Kaufmans here, but uh, uh, Jeff Kaufman's sister Janet is having some uh, health health problems, and so remember her, and then also the Lyles family, uh, remember them. Um, I did speak to them, and uh, I think they're on the tail end of the COVID thing, so I think they're all. Uh, uh, doing Kathy's the one who had the most trouble with it and I think she had some breathing issues and things so <clears throat> but uh, she's doing feeling much better um, so I'm assuming they'll probably another week or so they'll they'll be back to uh, among the living <laughs> you know so so uh, they'll, they'll be back to uh, to normal normality and so but continue to remember them and then also uh, continue to remember uh, Lindsay Hurley and the little little one um, as they're they're at home uh, recouping from uh, from giving birth as well and so uh, be with that family and uh, so let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to intervention upon the behalf of these and uh, brother would you would you come um, my mind just went blank hold on yeah, you've never had that happen have you <laughs> Mr. Hurley come on up here <laughs> Mr. Harrell <clears throat> Mr. Harrell Hurley Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for another opportunity to meet back in your house this morning on a beautiful Sunday morning, Lord. We're praying for you now. Each prayer request, Lord, will be those in a special way, Lord. Be with us in this service. May everything said and done be if you want to honor your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The song we're going to do is, um, you're going to be participating at, at a certain point, but this is a song that's to be sung as a prayer, and I hope it will be your prayer today, um, that Jesus is at the center of your life, that everything revolves around him. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Jesus, nothing
I'm just being honest with you, there is no way it is impossible for me in one session to give you everything there is to know about the church and the church that God, and give you all the characteristics of the church. So again, today is going to be highlights, uh, and, and we'll try to piece some of these things together for you so that you at least have a general understanding. Most of us have a general understanding of what the church is, and so some of this for you will be will be uh, repetition um, because you already know a lot of these things. But for some, uh, this will help build this foundation. And we talked about being grounded this whole year. This is what we've talked about. And so uh, it will help to build upon what we've, what we've already discussed. And so as we look at Acts chapter 2, we read this verse last week when it, when it, uh, regarding baptism. But there is an order to things. God is a God of order. And there is an order to things. And let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse number 41. And I just want to show you this order. And, and again, the, there's a sermon that has been preached, and now it, it comes a, a point in time to respond to the message that's been given. All right, in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, that says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. That word, that, that, that gladly received his word, that's talking about the gospel, that's talking about the message that Peter has just preached. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So there is there's a sequence of things that happened here. What's the first thing that, that happened here? They heard the word. They heard the gospel. And then, th let me just interject here, they believed the gospel, okay? They that gladly received it. They received his word. All right, they believed it. They heard it. They believed it. And then the next step was what? They were baptized, and then the next step is what? The same day were added unto the 3,000 souls. And this is talking about the church at Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to show you one other, uh, and, and I think last week we went through a lot of these patterns, uh, but I'm just going to show you one more, and this is just a, basically an example of this, but Acts chapter number 9. I hope, I hope all of you remember the story of the conversion of Saul. This is where Saul became Paul. All right, God changed his name. And uh, remember, Saul was a persecutor of the church. He went about killing Christians and hunting Christians down. As a matter of fact, he was responsible for the death of Stephen uh, as they stoned him in Acts chapter 7. And so as we look at this, this is, this is Saul's conversion. And uh, we'll look at the beginning part of this, and we follow this same pattern that we looked in Acts chapter number 2. 
uh, verse number 3 of chapter 9. And, he, and as he journeyed, this is Saul, he came to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord. That's an important word right there. The address that he makes. Now, remember what he's been doing. He's been killing Christians. He's been trying to do away with everybody named the name of Jesus Christ. Remember? He's been trying to do away with all of it. Trying to stamp out Christianity. This is what he's been trying to do. And then he meets Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And what does he call him? That's, that's an important word right there. Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick, kick against the prick. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So here, all of a sudden, you see Saul, who is resistant. Again, he's been pr- getting pricked. It is hard for thee to get, get, uh, kick against the pricks. So he has been resistant to the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. He has been resistant uh, to anything to do with Christianity. Now all of a sudden he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. He calls him Lord and now he becomes submissive to the will of God. Do you see that? All right, so let, let's, that's, that's the first part. That is salvation, believing. And then let's go down to verse number 17. He was told to go down and meet Ananias. And Ananias, the Lord works on the heart of Ananias to go and meet Saul. Now remember, there was fear in the hearts of believers when it came to Saul. He'd been killing people. He'd been hunting them down. He'd been searching for them. Let, let's, uh, let's see here. Where was I at? Verse number 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into a house. And putting his hands on him, this is Saul, and said, Brother Saul... The Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose, the next step, and was baptized. There you see that step again. He believed, he, he saw the Lord, he heard the message. He submitted to that message. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, called him Lord. And then the next step was baptized. Now, let's go a little further. Let's go to verse number 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. This is a natural, spiritually speaking, this is a natural progression. All right? You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You come to know Christ as your Savior. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. You understand? And then, and then the next step, I want to obey Him. I want to, I, want to, I want to let everybody know what Christ has done in my heart and in my life. And so you follow Him in baptism to make that public declaration. And then the next step is, hey, I want to be with God's people. I want, and it says, He is said to join Himself to the disciples. I want to be with God's people. And this is the next step. And it is an amazing thing the way God works and the things that God has done. So what the Lord Jesus Christ has done is he has instituted the church. All right, he's instituted the church. And when I'm speaking about the church this morning, I am talking about the local church. I understand, and I hope that you all understand, there is uh, the, the body, if you would, or there is the universal church that, that when you're saved, you, you become a member, okay, of that body, uh, but that is not the local church. All right, then, but, but God intends for us, and the Lord Jesus Christ intends for us to become part of a local church. Because when it comes to local church, and you're talking about ministry, the church is there, we're going to talk more about this in just a moment, is so that we can minister and be ministered to. Now, that does not happen with a global church. All right, that doesn't happen with a, with a universal church. That happens in, on the local level, on a local church. And any time that, that the word church is mentioned throughout the New Testament, it is referring to the local church. You have the church at Rome. All right, that, that, Romans is written to the church at Rome. Ephesians is written to the church at Ephesus. Thess- Thessalonians, First and Second Thessalonians, they're written to the church at Thessalonica. Uh, what have I missed? Galatia. Uh, the church at Gal- the Galatians are written to the church at Galatia. Uh, let me go through this. At Romans, first eight, Corinthians, uh, the church at Corinth, uh, and so you have the local church, who is a major part. It is the work through which the Lord Jesus Christ. 
does and works. All right? This is his body. We're going to look at some descriptive terms here in a moment. And so, uh, so let's first of all look at the possession of the church, the possession. How many of us, they, they, we say, well, even many times, I will say, I'm going by the church, or i got to stop off at the church, or, uh, you know, you ride by, or, and, and you may even say, that's my church, or, or something like that. And I have made statements like that, and even among pastors, well, this is what I do at my church, you know, uh, or, or things like that. But really and truly, it's not my church. Uh, I hope we understand that. It's not. We, we say that, but I hope that we understand intently that it is not my church. As a matter of fact, we're going to uh, see this. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, let, let me go in order here because you got an outline in front of you. <laughs> All right, so I have to go in order. All right, so, and, and now let's flip over to Matthew. So we saw that pattern. Now, now let's go over to Matthew chapter 16. Verse number 18. This is the Lord Jesus speaking. He's speaking to Peter in particular with his disciples all around him. He says, And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. All right, so let me just stop right there. And let me just say that he did not say, upon this rock, I will build your church. Or he also did not say, upon this rock, you will build my church. He says, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, we understand who the rock is. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. The, the foundation of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, uh, when you're talking about the foundation, you're talking about the pillar and ground of truth and, and, and Jesus Christ being the, written, the, the living word, the word of God being the, the written word, and they are truth. Remember, uh, full, the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 1, he's full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Lord Jesus Christ is truth. The Word of God is truth. They are inseparable. And so as we're looking at the church, the church is built upon the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, is built upon the foundation uh, of His Word. All right? So, and let me just say, when you get outside of that, when you get outside of truth being the foundation of the church, and I tell you this, it only becomes a social event or, or, or a social gathering. That's all it is. Uh, when, when you get away from truth, that's all it is. There's a lot of social gatherings going on this morning. There's a lot of them. And uh, but that, that, will, that they will call themselves a church. But I'm going to tell you, if you're not going to stand for truth, you cease to be a church because the church is the pillar and ground of truth and, it's, and the very, very building of it, the foundation of it, is the Lord Jesus Christ and His Word. All right. So it is built. I will build my church. Let me just add along with this. Not only did he build it and did he design it and did he uh, institute it, but he also bought it. Let's look in, back, back to Acts. Why don't you hold your finger in Acts? There are several passages in Acts that we're going to look at. Acts is the history of the church, if you would, or the, the beginnings of the church. And so it, we would do well to look at several passages here in, in the early New Testament church there. But Acts chapter 20, and I'm not going to look at every one of these scriptures that I have written down for you. There's no way we possibly can. You can go and study them at your leisure. But Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock. This is talking to pastors in particular. Over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Not only is he building it, but the other side of this is that he has purchased it. He has bought it. It is his. By right of creation, it is his by right of buying, by purchase power. He's bought it. He's paid for it with his own blood. Now, you and I, we understand that this, the church is not the building. The church is people. The people well, I told you before, we, we say we're going to the church, or this is my church. Really and truly, this is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the church is not a building, the church is the people, because it is the people that the Lord Jesus Christ has bought with His blood. It, it, is, it is people. 
And so as we gather here today, we're gathering as a church. The church, Mount Carmel Baptist Church in Troy, North Carolina. This is, this is our location. So if, if the Apostle Paul were to write a letter to us, it would be to the church at Troy, all right, or, or something along those lines. And, uh, and so, but it would not be a letter to this building. It would be a letter to you and to me. It would be a letter to the people. And, and that's what the church is. And, and let me just give you a definition real quickly. And, and it is a, a church. It is a called out assembly, called out of the world, separated from the world to serve and to love and, and to propagate the gospel of, of the living God. All right, but let me give you this definition. It is a called out assembly. This is what a dictionary would tell you. But I'm going to piece some things together for you. I said, and, and a church is a group of baptized believers. We see that in the scripture, right? A group of baptized believers who have voluntarily joined themselves together. When we looked at that example of the Apostle Paul, was he forced to go find the disciples and to join, him, join himself to them? No, he did it of his own accord. So it is a group of baptized believers that have voluntarily joined themselves together to carry out the Great Commission. That is our purpose. Now, that, that's, that, that's really the message in a nutshell right there. A group of baptized believers that have voluntarily joined themselves together to carry out the Great Commission. All right. So it is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is His church. It has been built by Him and is being built by Him, and it has been bought by Him. And so, uh, the pictures of the church. Let's go. Let's go through this. The pictures of the church, and uh, and I'm just going to read one verse uh, as we go on down through here. But the the pictures of the church. When you're talking about there are there are several pictures that God gives, and these th this is not exhaustive by any means, but it's called the body of, of Christ. And and within that body, I believe it was Ephesians. I think I'm going to look at the Ephesians one. That, that I have that I have noted for you there. Ephesians chapter one, verse number twenty-two. Now this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That is, one, that is one scripture, and, and the reason I picked, chose this scripture here to give to you, but there are three others that, I, that I've listed here that mention the church being the body. But in this particular verse, who is the head of this body? The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the body. All right, the Lord Jesus Christ is. Uh, let, me, let me go back to it. read it one more time. And hath put all things under his feet. Let me back up. Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ, Christ, remember that, when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus Christ and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the body. So, we're talking about the body, the church being a body, and of course, there are other passages, and, and they're listed here, about a body being fitly framed together. We have arms, and fingers, and hands, and toes, and, and heart, and organs, and, 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 you know, and legs, and, and a mind, and, and eyes. We have all these things that work together to make that body function as God intends for it to function. Now, at the same time, God brings people together that have voluntarily joined themselves together for the work of ministry to carry out the great commission and he does this in such a way so that all of these different members of the body are coming together to make up the church the church is not necessarily an organization though it is but it is an organism it is a living breathing thing do you understand I mean there are people involved and it is a living breathing thing now, I, I'm going to tell you, 
there's something that I miss. And I'm just going to give you an example of this. There's something that I miss. You know all this COVID mess and all this stuff, and we're having to separate and all this, do all these things. Is one thing that I miss is our choir being up here. I, I don't know if you miss. Now, look, I, I, I'm telling you, uh, the, the ones that are up here, and I know we're only allowing a few up here, they're doing a great job. All right, they're doing a great job. But I'm going to tell you, it's just not the same as having everybody together and singing and, 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 and proclaiming uh, praises to the Lord. It's just not the same. Now, do you understand how at times when people are not here, how I, this is a perfect example. When certain people are not or cannot be in the place that God intends for them and the, and the gifts that God has given to them and using in that capacity, how the church does not flourish and does not prosper like it ought to. Or is not is not the same. You understand what I'm saying? And so, but in, in all of that, the head of that is what? Is who? So he's he's built it, he's bought it. The, the body, he's the head. Christ is the head. Let's look at the second one. And I have got to fly. I'm telling you, I, I'm going too slow. All right? And so uh, the bride is another one. Let's go to Ephesians. This is just another picture that the Lord gives us of the function of the church and the way that the Lord looks at the church. I hope that you have heard of the bride of Christ before, the bride, and how the rapture, he's coming for his bride. I hope that you, you've heard these things. But Ephesians, let me find it. Ephesians chapter 5. There is a descriptive passage here about, he's comparing marriage, the husband and the wife, and comparing that to Christ and the church. Christ being the bridegroom and the church being the bride. And you, this is reiterated in many places throughout Scripture. This is just one of them that I'm pulling out here. But Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So, again, you have this picture about the love that a man and a woman have for each other. All right? You have that picture. And this is the same picture that God gives to us about Christ and how he loved the church and gave himself for the church. How that Christ loves us and how, we, as the church, we are to love Christ and we love the Lord. And so we are his bride and, and, we, and he is our bridegroom. And so there's another picture that's there. But then there's a third picture that I've given you here, and that's a building. Building. And, uh, and uh, Ephesians, I hope you didn't lose your place there like I did. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse number 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together, growing unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for inhabitation of God through the Spirit. There it is. That's just another picture that the Lord gives of the church as being a building. Now, this building is not talking about this shell of a building. It's talking about our bodies. And this body that we have, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, whom he has built, whom he has bought. And, uh, and the church being built upon the foundation, the very foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the apostles on top of that. You remember the verse that we read, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, he's speaking of uh, Peter being that apostle, but what goes under Peter is the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. It, without him, the building falls apart. Without him, there is no building. Without him, there is no church. And so it is being built together. 
And again, that building, we talked about this being the pillar and ground of truth. So we looked at the possession of the church, the pictures of the church. Now let's look at the position of the church. <clears throat> and we're going to look at the anatomy of the church a little bit. Uh, and, and this is briefly. And, uh, and so there are two offices within the church. Now, uh, when, when I say offices, these are, uh, these are voted positions. We vote on lots of things, but these are two positions that the Lord has instituted. Uh, and so let's go to Acts uh, let me find it, chapter 6. And the, fir- the first one we'll look at here is deacons. Uh, Acts chapter 6. Now, before this time, there were no deacons. Remember, this is the early church. We're talking about the church at Jerusalem who started there in about Acts chapter number 2-ish. Uh, you know, there's some discrepancy with some of that with some scholars and different things like that about when the church started. Uh, but, you know, we can argue that till the cows come home. Um, but anyway, so nevertheless, we, but we have principles of when the church began and, and, and the things that they began to institute. And, and there became a point in time when the preachers, the disciples that were there at this church, the pastors that were there at this church could not possibly do all the work. Remember, we've already read that verse in Acts chapter 2 where they added 3,000 souls. Because I want you to imagine this church. Uh, this is a very large church. Thousands of people come into this church. And um, this is one of the first churches at Jerusalem there. And so, and so as, as you can imagine that the workload, as, as the membership increases, the workload increases, all right? And so there comes a point in time where the, the disciples couldn't get to everything. And so we'll read that. And in those days, the number of the disciples were multiplied. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in daily ministration. And the twelve called the multitude, the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we have appointed over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor, Timon, uh, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. This is the first mention of deacons. All right, This is deacons, servants. This is what they do. We have deacons here at our church, and I'm thankful for our deacons. I could call any of my deacons at any moment, and, and, and they, would, they would help me any way that they possibly could. I mean, that's the way I feel about them, you know. I mean, it didn't matter what it was. If I, if I called them at 2 o'clock in the morning and said, look, this is what I need, I, and it needs to be done at this moment, you know, our deacons, they would get up and they would get dressed and they, they, they would do it. If that, they're servants. They're servants. If there was a legitimate need, I'm not saying, you know, I want them to get out of bed and just do something, but if there's a legitimate need, they would, be, they would, they would serve in any way and any possible any way possible, and, and I'm so thankful for them, and that's the heart of a deacon is to serve, and, uh, and so, and, and when that happens, when, when, when the pastor can spend the time that he needs to spend in the Word, when, and, 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 and propagating the Word, and studying, and prayer, and the, deci- and, and, and the, and the uh, deacons serving as they should, and it's not to say that they neglect their prayer time, or their Bible study at the same time, and not to say that the pastor neglects his you understand what I'm saying? But as we work together like that, as the pastor and the deacons work together serving and propagating the gospel, getting the gospel out, what does it say? The very last words that, that I read there. Let me find it. Uh, verse number 7. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient into the faith. So we see the, the, the increase of the gospel, the increase uh, of, of the gospel going forth. Uh, when, when deacons are doing their job and the pastor is doing his job. Now, let me just give you another here, uh, and this is in regard to pastor. These are the two offices. But let's look at Titus for a moment. <clears throat> Titus chapter 1. Now, again, within these, and we don't have time to go into all these, there are qualifications. There, there are all these things that, that need to be looked at when it comes to uh, deacons. But uh, Titus chapter 1. Uh, well, if I can get there. Verse number five. <clears throat> For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. 
If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, not no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. All right, so this is the position of Pat. It says elder here. There are three words that are used in the New Testament, but it refers to the same position. These are pastors, elders, and uh, did I even write that down? And bishop. Pastors, elder, and bishop. All right, and they're all referring to the same, the same position there. And so these, are, these have qualifications. Both the pastor and the deacon have qualifications. I just read you some of them. And uh, <clears throat> that they must meet. But then, so we looked at the offices there, but then I want to look at others. Because here's the thing. The church is not the church without others. We have, we have offices, yes, but we also have others. And uh, I want to look at Romans 12. And I know we're flipping back and forth in these topical things. I really would rather just preach a passage, to be honest with you. Uh, but Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> verse number 4. Now, I hope this, this will refresh your memory here. We're talking about the body. They're talking about the body, the church. For as many, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. I'll stop right there. And, and, and this goes back to the example that I gave you, the choir. Uh, but, and then we can use other examples. You know, there are some people that have the gift of just uh, encouragement. Yeah, you've met people. I think Miss Sharon has that gift. Miss Sharon, I'm going to pick on you this morning. And, uh, and I think Miss Sharon has that gift. She may not know this or not. I don't know. But every single time she comes into church, there's a smile on her face. She's anxious about being here. And I'm going to tell you that that excites my heart, but th- ju- just, just being there. But then, you know, I, and look, it, 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 every single time she tells me how great the message was, whether, whether it was awful or not, you know, she comes and tells me, she said, oh, that was, that was so great. That's the best one yet and all this stuff, you know. And, uh, but, but what she's doing is she's encouraging She's encouraging. And, uh, and, and I'm going to tell you what, every church needs people to be encouraged. You know, and, and we're going to look at this in just a moment, a little further. But what I'm saying is everyone has a gift. If, you're, if you've been born of the Spirit, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, God has given you a gift to contribute to that body, to make that body all that Christ wants this body to be. You understand all this local assembly? He's given that. And so if you... Don't do anything at church. Now listen to me. Then you're not fulfilling the role that God has for you. Because God has given you a spiritual gift. And, and that, it, it, look, the church is not about coming to be blessed. Do you understand? I, I hope, I, now look, I understand we have visitors and we have all those things, but that is not what ch- coming to church is about. Coming to church is not about coming to be blessed. Coming to church is about coming to be a blessing. That's what the church is about. Coming to exercise the gift that God has given to us to be a blessing to everyone else. We're coming not to be served, but to serve. Do you understand? That's what church is about. We have so many people that come to church and they think, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to sit here and and, preacher bless me. Or choir bless me. That's not why we're here. We're here to sing praises to the Lord collectively. Look, you're not involved in this. Do you understand? The only part that you have involved in worshiping the Lord is you directing your attention and your heart and your hands and your mind towards Him. That's what church is about. All right. So, we should collectively be using our gifts so that the body of Christ would be as it should and, and, to, and to function and orchestrate and, 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 and do what it should as, as Christ intended. All right, so this is the others. This is the anatomy and then the autonomy. Let me see what time it is. Oh, man, we're, all right, we've got to fly. <clears throat> the autonomy, the autonomy. 
Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians. And I'm just going to give you an example. I'm not going to read all of these. Chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 1. This is just an example. Now concerning the collection for the saints, if I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. This is a principle that he's given to these churches. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay up in him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring li your liberality unto Jerusalem. And if it be me, that I go also, that they go with me. There, there's something going on here. They're taking up offerings. All right? And they're actually taking up offerings for works that are going on. This is a missions offering, if you would. Uh, I think this could also be uh, into our tithes and offerings. I think this principle here. But the, the, the key thing is, it says here that, that, that of letters that you approve. You understand? This is what it says. Let me find it here. Uh, and when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters. Did the Apostle Paul come to this church and say, look, you're going to have to give money to this? Is that what he's saying? He, I, we're going to give to this mission, mission or this work. This is what you're going to do, and I'm coming to get some money from you. Is that how he says? No, he's saying, he's saying whomever you approve, whomever you approve, then, then, then I, will, I will aid you. I will help you. If this put somebody at Jerusalem, I'll take the offering back to Jerusalem. If this is, if this is what the church... So the autonomy, and I could give you more and more scripture about this, but the idea behind autonomy is that we, uh, we do not answer, and that we are submissive. I'm going to explain this in just a minute. We don't answer to a hierarchy. You understand what I'm saying? We don't answer to a hierarchy. We self-govern. We govern ourselves. Uh, there are times when, let, let me ask you something. I, well, let's take a vote right quick. It would be all right if I take ten more minutes. Okay. All right. And I know all of you are starving to death and all those kind of things. All right. But it, just bear with me, okay? I don't want to stop here because I'm getting to the heart of what I'm, I'm getting at. All right. And so we are autonomous. Meaning that whatever this church decides to do, that's what we do. We're, we, it's not dictated to us how we have to respond, what we have to do. And what I mean by that, this local assembly decides that. Now, me as a pastor, I don't decide all the things that we do. I might bring it to you as a church, and we will pray about that. We will seek the Lord about that, and, and along with deacons and everyone else, and we'll pray and seek the Lord uh, because all of us have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and if we're in unified, then the Lord is going to lead us in a certain direction, and we will all say, okay, this is what needs to be done, and yes, we agree with this, and yes, that we're going to move forward with this, and this is what we're going to do. But... We, we vote on that. Do you understand that? We, this is our decision. We self-govern. We self-govern. Uh, our bylaws. We self-govern our bylaws. The way that we are, the way that things, we, our structure process. Now, that, all of these things that I'm giving you have to line up with Scripture. We can't decide we're going to do something and it be contrary to Scripture. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, and so, uh, but anyway, we're autonomous. That means that we govern ourselves. As a matter of fact, let me just say, as far as the Southern Baptists go, let me, let me just say how that works. Uh, they don't dictate to us what we're to teach, what we're to preach, how we're to believe. They don't, they don't dictate any of those things, where we're supposed to send money to. They don't dictate a, that to us. As a matter of fact, everything goes from the bottom up. All right? We vote on things. We, we, we tell them, no, this is the direction we want to go. This is what we want to see. This is what we want to do. And, uh, and so... We as a church can make those decisions together. Do you understand what I'm saying? Of how the church is handled and, and, and we self-govern. Anyway, all right. <clears throat> also, that, within that comes accountability as well. Now, here's the thing. You as a church, now I'm telling you, you as a church are to hold me accountable. Are you ready? You're to hold me accountable. Who is the head of the church? Christ is the head of the church. And all of us collectively fall under his submission and fall under his authority. All right? Do you understand? They fall under his authority. Now, and then you have an under-shepherd. That would be my position is an under-shepherd. All right? And then as an under-shepherd, uh, and I just told you how we, how we try to do things, uh, then we have that under-shepherd. But you are, what, what if I get up here and I start teaching something that's contrary to, to Scripture? Okay, yeah, I mean, 
Now, it's one thing to misspeak something. You understand what I'm saying? To misspeak something. But it's another thing to, to teach false doctrine and to teach, some, to teach something again that is contrary to Scripture. That's something completely different. And, 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 and in Luther, he says, you're out of here. You know, that's what he said. And, and, and look, and rightly so. Are you hearing me? And rightly so. If I don't teach and preach God's Word for what God is saying and what lines up with the, with the whole counsel of Scripture, then I'm going to tell you, then I'm responsible to you for that. You understand? And I'm going to give account to God for that, and you're to hold me responsible. But at the same time, we hold each other responsible. We hold each other responsible, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. All right, so there's accountability that comes into that as we self-govern. So um, the purpose of the church is to evangelize. Now, we went over this one already, Matthew 28, to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, let's see, hold on, I'm misquoting that. And lo, I'm with you always, even at the end of the, end of the earth. Um, Nevertheless, this is the purpose of the church, is to evangelize. To reach people with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you and I, at, that God has given gifts, we come together collectively to use our gifts to, in turn, reach the world with the gospel. Do you understand that? Now, God has called me to preach. Now, I hope you recognize that. I get it. You called me as your pastor many years ago. Excuse me. And uh, you recognize that calling upon my life. And, and you, there are some of you who have the gift of teaching. There are some of you that have the gift of hospitality. There are some of you that have the gift of encouragement. And as we collectively come together and God is able to bring all of those things together as a body for the purpose of evangelizing this world, the people around us. That's the purpose of it. That is our purpose. If you could if you say, why are we here today? Why are you here today? Yes, we're to praise and honor the Lord, but we come together together to carry out the Great Commission. This is the mission that God has given to us, the Lord Jesus Christ has given to us, to preach the gospel, to reach people with the gospel. And to keep training and, and, and baptizing and bringing into the church and edifying the church so that the body becomes more and more fluid and, the, and, and, and it becomes more and more like a body. It's hard to function when you only got one hand or one, one finger. But when you have several fingers, it makes it so much easier and it harmonizes so much better. But that's, what, that's the building of the church. All right? And, and he, he allows us to be a part of that. Uh, he is building his church. And we only get to share the gospel, but he does the rest of it, right? We share the gospel, and whether they receive it or reject it is on them. And the Lord does his work. He's building his church. So we evangelize. The next thing is that we encourage. Now, us as a church, and I do want to look at these scriptures, all right? Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. Verse number 15. Moreover... If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with him one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. So here we go. Here comes some accountability here when it comes to church. And this is, I, I label this as encouragement. Because here's the thing. When someone gets out of line, what I mean by that is biblically. They're out of line. Just say they begin to live a life of sin. They, they bring things into their life that ought not be there. Or perhaps they neglect things that ought to be there. This is the job of the church to step in front. And I put in there to get in front. To get in front and say, hey. You know, look, I want to encourage you to do what is right. This is what the Lord says, and this is what the Lord desires. And to get in front of that person so as not to break fellowship with them, so as not to see them fall into sin, so as not to, uh, you know, uh, to them to get away from church and get away from the Lord. But we get in front of that. You understand? That's part of our job. That's part of, part of what we do to encourage in that, in that way. All right, and then also to get behind. Let's look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. <clears throat> Brethren.
Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens. Well, let, let me back up. I'm getting ahead of myself there. But what do we do? We, we restore. All right, so now we're getting in front to, to block them from getting into sin. But then once people have fell off into sin or they're, they're caught up in something, what do we do? Oh, we just write them off and say, okay, man, they're done. They're never coming back here. Get out of here. We don't want you anymore. Is that what we do? No. With the love of Christ in our heart, just like he did to Peter, just like he's done to you and me at times, we bring them back to our fellowship as long as they have a repentant heart and say, look, I've been wrong, and I desire fellowship again. And what we do is we bring them back into that fellowship. We restore them. Now, I'm not saying they can immediately go back to being a deacon or going back. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? They have to earn that again. But look, uh, we restore them, and we can encourage them to continue living the way that God intends for them to live. So to get behind them, you understand what I'm saying? We get behind them, and we're pushing them toward the Lord. Does that make sense? Uh, so we get in front of people to block them from, from getting into sin. We get behind them, push them toward the Lord. And then Galatians 6, 2, we get under them. Look, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know, as we come together as believers as a church, there are many times that people come in and they have their heart broken. Something that has happened in their life. Something that they're going through. Something that they got blindsided by they never saw coming. You know what we do? I, I gave some prayer requests here this morning, didn't I? Some people having biopsies and sometimes that can be a little unnerving. You know what? And we come to a place like this, like, like with God's people, the body of Christ, the church. And we let them know what our burden is. And we can take that burden collectively as a church and we can help share that burden. Do you understand? We help share that burden. We begin to pray for that person. Because here's the thing. As all of us sitting in here, if we know Christ is our Savior, we believe that, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And that we have a God who can do all things. And we have a God that we can pray to and he can answer our prayers and he can hear us. And that we as a church, we can come together and we can share our burdens one with another. And as we hear those burdens and, and our hearts are burdened for that person, we can lift them up to the Lord. We can give that to the Lord. We can pray to the Lord and watch the Lord intervene on their behalf, but we can share their burdens. And I'm going to tell you something. I am just so glad that I'm a part of a local church that is owned and purchased by the Lord Jesus Christ who built it. <clears throat> that is the body, the bride, the building of the Lord Jesus Christ who is completely autonomous who is made up of offices, yes, but then we're made up of others with all these gifts that people have that God has given to for the purpose of evangelizing and for the purpose of encouraging those that are around us. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be a part of? It's a wonderful thing to be a part of, and I'm so thankful. Look, this is not a man-made thing. This is a thing that the Lord has made, the Lord has built, and the Lord has bought. And I'm going to tell you, He allows us to be a part of it. He allows us just to be a little part of it. He allows us to serve. He allows us to be a part of that. He allows us to see people baptized. He allows us to see people come to know him as their Savior. He allows us to pray to him, to share our burdens with him, to encourage one another in all those forms and fashions. Oh, what a privilege it is to be a part of a church. And I'm going to tell you, don't ever let anyone tell you that the church is not necessary. Because the church is necessary. The Bible tells us, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Lord instituted this. And I'm going to tell you, some of these attacks that we've seen as of late against the church, it's all attacks from Satan. But I want you to know that Satan is not going to be victorious over the church. He might be victorious over a building. <laughs> he might be victorious over something like that. But I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you and me, 
he will never be victorious over that because we have the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ he's already won the victory it's a matter of how we allocate it in our life and we can be a part of that together collectively as his people as his body as his bride as his building what a wonderful thing to be a part of a church and I'm so glad God allows me to be part of it and I hope you are too you may have some other burden on your heart I don't know I know we have things going on this week people having biopsies and and people been in auto accidents and different things like that you may have some other burden that you've been dealing with you want to come share with the Lord and I want you to know that God wants to hear it he wants to hear it he wants to hear our prayer of humility calling out to him knowing that he's the only one who can meet the need that we have Maybe there's someone here who's never accepted Christ as their Savior. I want you to know that we can take the Word of God and show you how you can know heaven's your home. You can be certain of it. Perhaps you've never been baptized. We can take care of that. We won't do it this morning, but we, we, can, we can talk about that. Perhaps you've never joined a church. You're not part of a local church. But you need to be so that you can use the gifts that God has given to you. This is the entity that God has established to carry out His work. And you can be a part of that. Oh, what a privilege. Let's stand together and sing a hymn invitation. And if the Lord has spoken to you about something, maybe you have a burden, you can come share it with Him. Let's sing together. being here today and look I understand I flew through this thing today take those sheets with you if you don't if you don't have one back there the scriptures are on it go go home study those scriptures uh, you get a good understanding I, I think most of you have a good understanding of this this is just to reiterate and to and to solidify in your heart and mind uh, the purpose of the church what we're here for and uh, and and just wonderful to be a part of it I'm so thankful that I am I hope that you are <clears throat> there's a lot of places that will go today and will not have a place to meet because uh, even in China right now you know they are persecuting Christians and uh, they're finding churches those who are gathering to worship and uh, I've read some uh, some other pla- other places and other other things going on well they will uh, arrest pastors they will they will arrest all these things because they're gathering to meet as God's people you ought never take for granted what you have never and thank the Lord for it. Be grateful for it. And uh, so let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Um, Blair, you want to dismiss us in a word of prayer, please? Don't forget about the meeting, uh, about the Wild Game Supper right down here if you want to help with that. All right, Blair, go ahead.